My name is Aaron Khan. I am a faculty member over at Herzing University. I'm also the chair of the technology department. So my major role is teaching programming as well as video programming. So the way it works. I think it's a little bit easier. Okay, so the way it works for our system is we do three semesters a year, two terms per semester, eight weeks per term, four hours per session, two days a week, and there's three game programming classes. So in other words, we only have 24 weeks to get someone caught up to speed and learning how to program for video games. So it's a very accelerated format. So we do run into a couple of issues. There's three major problems that arise from this system. So the first one is, how do you get programming students, and even non-programming students, engaged in the game program? As we all know, it's a hard concept, it's a hard topic, it's a hard material. So how do you get people engaged in wanting to learn this material? How do you maximize retention and comprehension of game programming fundamentals in accelerated format? Again, if it's that quick, how do you actually maintain that information? And then finally, how do you narrow down the focus of game programming to make it effective and accessible in such a short amount of time? There's a ton of things that can be considered game programming. Very wide variety, and it's all different. So the trick is, how do you narrow this focus down to actually effective? So the way we set it up is there's three classes, game programming one, two, and three. In the first class, we cover the basics. In the second class, we step it up a little bit more. And then the third class is advanced concepts. So over the course of 24 weeks, we go over the variety of materials. So starting with game programming one, the basic structure looks like this. So weeks one through four, we do a crash course in the C++. This is a hard crash course. On day one of all my classes, I tell my students this is a trial by fire. In other words, it's going to be difficult, it's going to be really, really painful at times because you struggle, but it's important information and you've got to get through it. So that's the first four weeks. We cover everything from the ground up, assuming that you don't have any programming experience for the most part whatsoever. Starting weeks five through eight, we switch over to OpenGL and basic 2D game programming. But throughout the entire time of the course, we're also talking about basic game programming fundamentals. So as far as C++ goes, we cover all these topics in under four weeks. So everything from variables to functions to class definitions to object-oriented programming to sorting algorithms to input and output streams to pointers. And we cover all of this in four weeks. This is probably by far one of the hardest parts of the entire sequence because it's new for a lot of people. If they have programming experience, C++ has enough work to keep them on their toes. If they have no programming experience, Plus, plus is that's That's the first four weeks. Second four weeks, we switch over to OpenGL. So we start with the absolute basics, working with the graphics library like this. How do you draw a window? How do you get something drawn on the screen? How can you move something on the screen? How do you detect user input? And how can you get collision detection to work? An important thing to note, though, in this case, is I'm only using version 1.1 of OpenGL. Granted, we're already on version 4.0. 1.3 for a lot of machines at this point. But 1.0 is far more accessible for students than other versions because it's a core library, it's been established, and everybody on any machine can use 1.1. So in order to get something up and running quickly, yes, it's a little updated, but it works for As far as game programming topics go, we cover basic and advanced movement, bounding box collision detection, necessary and required math, so there is some math that goes into this, and we review all that. 2D and 3D transformations, user interface, heads up displays, and graphical user interface design, and how do you actually go about designing a project? So, all this is covered within eight weeks. And the first example I give all my students to get them used to working with C is Hello World. Um, just a, a lot of curiosity is to show of hands how many core programmers. Awesome. So, we can actually go through a longer example. Okay, so the first example I give everyone is the Hello World. Because you gotta start something. And Hello World is, let's face it, a tradition amongst programmers. It's also a sanity check. If it doesn't work, there's something wrong with your installation. At least potentially. So if you can get this to work, theoretically you can get anything else to work too. So we break it down step by step. Show them what a common new block is, tell them what files they need to include, and each part of the code is explained as we go through the slides, as well as a recap as we go through it. So then I a little bit more code, I tell them what each component is, and then we step through it line by line, make sure that everybody's through it as in typing this in. So we get a little bit more functionality, this time we're picking out a little bit of the screen, and 
finally, our overall program is a miss to just get things work. Now, uh, just as a point of clarification, we're using Windows Golf Machines and Visual Studio 2010 for all of our development plans. So that's our first basic example of covering the new program plan. Just to get everybody used to working with C++. And then, of course, we gradually and quickly speed up our difficulty talks. So as part of learning how to actually design for games, I give my students a couple of design challenges to start with. These design challenges are homework assignments where they come up with the code structure of how to actually implement a game that's relatively simple. So something like Battleship or Blue or Tetris. But something that everybody knows well enough that they can actually understand how the pieces tie together. On the programming assignment side, the first four weeks are nothing but command line interfaces. So they're not worrying about graphics, they're not worrying about user input or output necessarily. It's just about getting the logic to work. The logic doesn't work, nothing else is going to work either. So some of the examples we go over for that are a number guessing game. So a basic binary search, rock, paper, scissors, or for some students they decide to expand it to rock, paper, scissors, so they can They also do Hangman, uh, a single game from Mario Party called Pass the Bomb. It's kind of like Hot Potato. But you don't know what the counter is in your deck ranking every time. And then also the game Python. So it's kind of like war, but it's sort of down a When we finally go over to the graphical side, they go over some basic 2D drawing, just to get used to the interface. And then they switch over to block breaker and metal shape. So again, right from the start, we're getting game examples every single time. In game programming, too, we switch gears a little bit. So the first week is mostly review. But we also go over a little bit more advanced concepts including three main things from when the program actually starts to understanding really in detail how the point is going. Weeks two to five, we switch over to basic 3D OpenGL as well as advanced 3D OpenGL. And then finally, the last two weeks, of course, are the part of the Throughout the entire time, though, we're also talking about advanced and intermediate topics of the So in this particular example, on the OpenGL side, we cover texture, drawing and 3D shapes, cameras and navigation, models and lighting and material, as well as how to actually structure all that correctly in code. So the next example, uh, as far as intermediate topics go, we cover artificial intelligence, we cover passive weight protection, so separating axes here on bonding box weight protection, bonding weight protection at that point, spheres, circles, cylinders. But we have to go over all the math that we have to go over for this and get that to We also go over basic animation, so how can we actually load a model and get a group and animate Again, applying that same concept to type of displays, interfaces, and talking about how to actually like design these kinds of too. So, this example is the first one to go over when we switch over to 3D and the geo. And the basic one, the basic setup for this one is three weeks more how to navigate the room space. So, see, most of you guys are programmers, why do you set this? So, the first thing we need is a simple bounding box just to get everything to show up on the screen correctly. So, we created tile lines. So we have position, size, color, if it's lit or if it's not lit, we draw a function and then we apply to this function. So we actually have that code in the frame. We then go through and initialize all of our variables. And we have our draw function. So we just step through each point, build the code, and explain it. At this point in the class, though, they're comfortable with the basic concepts. So we don't have to keep listing off every single command as we go. So we can do much more complicated examples. Collision detection, all we're doing is simple bombing box, so we grab all the signs and more check. Inside the main class, we have a list of our function prototypes, just to get everything organized correctly, list of our variables. Then we have our visualizations. So we set everything up, do the background screen, get the game, just so we have something to work with. So we have both our tiles drawn, our display function, so we can actually draw everything. Be great so we can See what we're navigating around in 3D space. And then we start messing with the camera. So, how do you actually determine where you're looking inside 3D space? So, we set up those commands here, draw a couple of additional objects, reset function, and then we actually go over the math required to actually get the camera to rotate. Because it's a much harder concept to get early on, we stripped out most of the extra material. So, we only worry about rotating on the y axis. We're making certain on the exit plane. In other words, forward and backward movement, left and right movement, and turn left and right, just to keep it simple. So, moving left and right, and moving forward and backwards. So again, just basic equations showing how it all works. 
We also then have to read it from the keyword, which can also work. We have our reshape function in case the screen changes, and we have our update function to handle our collision detections. So in a lot more detail, we cover this in about two hours during one of my classes. And we need to fix something else like this. So we can actually navigate through 3D space, and when this yellow tile applies to that yellow tile, we can actually see a collision happening through the screen. So this is the first experience that a lot of students have actually building a 3D application. So for the programming assignment side, the first one I give my students is a Madlib just to kind of recap C++ fundamentals as well as working with input from the command line. We then switch over to the graphical programs again. So the first one I give them that side is a 3D page where they have a bunch of room, they have to navigate through 3D space. The next assignment directly builds off that as a 3D dungeon. So there's textures, there's pickups, and there's an actual goal check at the end. We then switch gears to go back to 2D to focus on artificial intelligence for the entire week. So we go over things like pathfinding, case based reasoning systems, touch very, very briefly on genetic algorithms, but we cover all the different concepts. And then the final project is the Tower Defense game. Because after everything we've learned over the past few terms, it covers everything that I think pretty well. Collision detection, artificial intelligence, pathfinding, visualizations, instructions, and everything. So it's a great example of how to actually tie things together. At that point, it becomes a group model. And so all the groups are given the same task to be analog board game and make it into a copy. Doesn't matter which one it is, the exception of Battleship because it's there either that one. They get to pick whatever they want. Some examples that students have done in the past is they've done sorry, they've done in trouble, uh, a couple of people have done checkers, Chinese checkers, and it works. Because it's a they already know the concept and they can easily apply that to code. In game programming three, this is probably by far one of the harder ones, but it all depends on your perspective. Personally, I think game programming 2 is harder for students, but with game programming 3, there's more of an individual direction versus a I'm telling them how to do things. So it's mostly through problem. So the first week is just covering advanced OpenGL, so how to gain access to versions, let's say 1.2 through 4.3, if you want to use any of those functions. And then we used to create these all over the project. They can design everything from scratch. Throughout this time, though, we're also talking about intermediate and advanced game development topics whenever they come up. So either because a group has a question or because I thought of something cool to show them, but we kind of go over that throughout the rest of the term. So as far as intermediate and advanced concepts go, we talk about saving loading, checkpoints, serialization and deserialization, loading audio, loading and manipulating images, version control, and project design. When it comes to version control, we use uh, Cortis SVN, but you guys can use whatever you want. Honestly, as long as you get some experience with a version control system, it works. So the programming assignment is pretty straightforward, and I just have to configure glue, bevel, and open nail. If you're going about teaching this, whatever you want to use for an audio library or an image library works, these are just a good have. As far as glue goes, because it's a Windows system, it doesn't come natively supporting, at least from a function standpoint, the upper version. So you have to have a way to pull those into your application. And that's where Blue comes in. The group project will be designed from the absolute bottom up. All in C, all in OpenGL, using no other external libraries than the ones that are provided already. So they have to design everything from scratch. They also have to design, uh, design a custom tool for their application. So it's something like a level editor or a character designer or something, but some way to supplement the development process. Throughout this period, though, they also come with tutorials. And these tutorials are student driven. They're allowed to choose whatever topic they want, minus anything that I've already covered. So people go over things like fog, uh, advanced sliding techniques, advanced material and extra techniques, as well as uh, sprite sheets and other applications. But the cool thing is that it's because it's student driven, they're more passionate about the topic, which from an educational standpoint drives that home further. And the whole class just really seems to get that. So the results. So admittedly, during the first round of game programming one, it was a little rocky. So out of the 34 students, 10 ended up failing the class. And part of that was due to the first time of the new class. The other part of it was in really due to students not turning assignments in. So from an educational standpoint, you'll always have to struggle with that component. So the pass rates were only about 70 and a half percent. In game programming two, it got a little bit better, it hit 80 percent. In game programming three, we actually got as high as 93.33 percent. So 
retention was good, pass rates were good, from an educational standpoint, big improvement. With the second wave, the game programming two, we're already starting to see, sorry, game programming one, we're already starting to see an increase in retention and comprehension. And our pass rates are getting higher too. Again, same problem, some students not turning things in. In game programming two, it's currently in progress, we're still hitting about 80%, but they haven't turned in their final projects yet. That's happening too. I'm expecting those three apps to actually jump up to at least be user passing, if not higher. So in other words, over the course of one full pass through, and a little bit, we've gotten almost everybody passing in program two. It's by far the harder course of the series. The other thing to point out though is as this is going through, a lot of people are realizing either A, game programming is just not for them, or that it really is for them. And as soon as that happens, they really buckle down and Holy cow, this is awesome material. So when it comes to game programming, if you're trying to teach this material, it can be really daunting task. So if you don't have any experience teaching before, and you're trying to get into it from a traditional computer science background, start with the real basic fundamentals of C++. So things like variables, functions, the hello world that's happening today, control statements, high level object learning concepts, so what's a class, how you make functions, how you do variants, that kind of thing. And then couple with basic math that they're going to use. So I recommend trigonometry at least. Calculus would actually be preferred, but again, it depends on what your needs are and how you're teaching the material. If you have some community experience teaching game programming, or at least teaching programming, focus on the fundamental concepts of C++ from an object-oriented standpoint. Just to make sure that everything is consistent and that you focus what you need. So show how the variance works in C++, show how polymorphism works in C++, simply encapsulation and but the key thing is, show how it works. The best advice I can give you guys for teaching C++, slowly introduce one test. By far, this is the most confusing topic for every university. Whether it's because it's an indirect access, whether it's because it's different syntax, and when you start throwing that many uh, you know, asterisks in there, it just makes very confusing for students. Need to pick, but remember, do this slowly. So if you're doing, let's say, an AV course, I recommend not even thinking about introducing this until like halfway through week, or before. But you got to space this out so students actually have some opportunities to get into it. As far as learning open field goes, sorry, teaching open field, sorry, that. You have to make a decision on the version. If you choose an earlier version, more computers are going to support it, and depending on your school's needs, that means that more students can do their development outside of the class. And that's important. If, for example, you're in our situation where the campus goes and there's no on site lab, it's working once after 10 o'clock. You have to be able to do development after 10. Which means you have to do it on your home machine, which also means you have to do it on this. So, using an earlier version is going to make that a lot easier. If you want to use a more modern version, it's a little bit different, and you have to make sure that everybody can go out and close. But if you want to start out strong and get more advanced stuff, by all means, only if you're out of choice and good options here. My only recommendation, though, is that because it's harder for beginners to learn, the newer stuff, there's some good computer brain and shaders and the text rays and whatnot. Start slow with that stuff. Otherwise, you're more than likely to lose students if you get to lose it. Well, other bit of advice for teaching game programming that can recommend for this is maximizing the hands on components. So, anytime students have the opportunity to actually type something in and see it for themselves and working in front of them, that's the best way to drive the stuff on. And help you guys remember that. You always remember the phrase, excitable demons cause drastic concussions. So, explain the high concepts. Make sure that everybody understands what you're trying to do first. Then, show a demo of how it works. After that, have the students go through the example and code it. So what I usually do is go to the notes up on the slides, they type it up, you don't only step through line by line, and then they run it. If it doesn't work, they'll have them debug it. Or, as an educator, potentially if they can have have them debug it for that one too. It's a great way to make sure that the kind of being maintained that they can actually publish it. So once they actually have that working, we have. So by doing this, you can actually see the retention is happening in the market, which is really, really cool. The other thing is tie back to some of the truly related things. In my personal experience, I found that either comics, movies, video games, or food would always tend to be just, you know, real bad writers for the same thing. Um, I think I have a couple questions in the 
programming, you think all types of, it's all nothing but comic book jokes and video game references, but it all ties into game programming. Um, as an example, I had one student in a game program one class who was having just a really hard time understanding how classes are structured, how they tie together. But this one student in particular was a huge fan of Pokemon. So for an entire hour, we used Pokemon as our example of how to actually build a class, how to create instances of the class, how to refer to its properties and variables, and click. And just by being able to flow around those concepts, it was awesome. From an educational standpoint, and I didn't see this in Pokemon. Yeah, it's awesome. But it's that retention mode that you're looking for. Ah, yes. Whatever you're trying to teach us in the though, the other trick is having a game example for everything. So even with a simple, you know, let's write a basic user interface from the command line, make a game on it. So have them do things like uh, you know, a number of types of game, or a simple, well, now the counter is set to whatever, and you have to decorate it by one or two. Right now, and then keep doing something like that. But always tie it back to games and always give them small, simple games that they can actually get their hands around and protect On the learning side, it's a little bit different. So let's say that you want to start learning C or C sharp or some other language in terms of game programming. Step one, get a C or a C sharp book and go through the entire book. If you're trying to do sign your own. If you're looking at this in part of class, obviously your professor will be able to help you out a little bit more with that. But if you're trying to learn this on your own, you really got to quick. Pick either C or C or C sharp. If you could pick Java, personally, I recommend C or C sharp. If you learn C, every other language is easier in comparison. With C sharp, you get the same power as C without a lot of the headaches. That's the only reason why I wouldn't recommend Java, because it doesn't have that same power level that C sharp does. But it is as user friendly. So again, just personal preference. But C or C sharp for sure. The benefits of C sharp you can still develop for XA and for um, Xbox Live, and that works really, really well, really, really quickly. Really. So again, up to you. But C plus plus or C sharp. First example, you got to do no matter what it is. Hello oh, world. Well, yeah. It makes sense though too. As you step through that, you can see all right. This is how I can at least print something on the screen. Get comfortable writing simple functions. So things like power, sum, min, max. Uh, reversing an array, getting the length of an array, and that kind of thing. But very simple functions just to understand how all those components tie together. And then finally, start working through your object oriented programming. So, how would you go about designing Pong? How would you go about designing Pac Man? But very simple game that you know, that you love, that you've played hundreds and hundreds of times, like dots. But think about how to actually go about designing them. And if you always focus on games, it'll make things a lot easier. You have some previous programming experience. Take a project that you've done before and import it into this new language. So let's say, for example, you have a really just awesome Java program, and you're like, I want to make this work in C++. Good idea. Very challenging, but good idea. So then slowly transition that over to C++ code. Figure out what things are the same, what things are different. And then compare the two side by side as they run. And it will give you a much better indication of how those languages can be the exact same. Then, once you have that established and you're trying to come with the syntax, pick a simple game that you're very familiar with. So again, something like Hangman or Solitaire or Block Breaker or something. But pick a simple game and actually code it. And then finally, pick a slightly more complicated project, um, something like Checkers or Archeezy or something, so like a bigger project like that, and code that. The harder the project is at that third step, the more it's going to play. Because it's going to force you to do research force you to actually think through how all the problems can occur, how it can go wrong, how it will go wrong, and how you can fix it. The other key thing to remember, break it and build it. It's very rare where code will just work and that's it. You're constantly going to have to debug it and fix the issues. And by debugging, you are more than likely as programmers to use more bugs and more issues. Uh, one of the other faculty members that I work with always likes to tell this story. So before a major milestone, they had a grand total of five bugs left. And they were very excited about this. And it was 12 hours before, uh, yeah, 12 hours before the deadline. And one of their developers fixed one of those bugs. And awesome. And they realized that introduced another 315 bugs into the system 12 hours before the deadline. So it does happen, right? But the trick is just getting used to that and 
break it down and build it back up and seeing where you look for it. And the more you can do that, the more you understand how that happens, the less likely bugs are actually occurring. If you have no graphics programming experience before, make sure you're okay with the fundamental language for any graphics. So when it comes to C++ and OpenGL, make sure you understand C++ or C before jumping into OpenGL. If it's C Sharp and you're using XMA, make sure you understand C Sharp. If it's Java and you're using its applet library, understand Java, but at the same token, both are so tied together that you can't tell at the same time. First step though, with Online Hello World, you get a single window to draw. It doesn't matter what's on it, but just get a window to draw. If that doesn't work, you're not going to be able to see anything to test any further. So that's your hello world in this case. Then, draw a simple 2D or 3D shape, depending on what you're trying to work on. If you have no graphic experience whatsoever, you stick with 2D. It's far easier to debug, and it makes a lot of sense if you're rolling out on this one. If you have a little bit of at least 3D map experience, or you can make it 3D, work on 3D. But again, 2D is going to be a lot easier, especially if you're trying to learn from scratch. You can also draw multiple shapes or 3D shapes after that to make sure you understand the concepts. You can get one to work, you can get more to work. But if you can't get that first one, it's never going to happen perfectly. You can work through tutorials will also make you a lot better too. So there's a lot of great sites out there that show you exactly how to do something in a human graphics framework. So things like OpenGL has uh, Neon Helium. That's a really great website for tutorials. If you go to Google and just type in OpenGL tutorials, you'll get a ton of those options. And even if they're a little outdated, it shows you the names of the contents, and that's the important thing. But more important than any of that, make a game. Go from start to finish and actually make a game. It's actually complicated to do rock, paper, scissors, but just get a game and talk about it. And the more you can get back to work, the easier all that other stuff on you. And then you can really dive deep into either shaders or uh, textures or whatever other component of graphics you want to work on. But the trick is, it starts small. The other major thing I give all my students in day one is Nuren's Guidelines to Program. These are kind of tongue in cheek, but at the same time, they're really important concepts. So, first one, save often. As programmers, I'm sure we've all run into situations where everything was working fine, suddenly a power outage, and all of our data is just gone. Globally annoying, you laugh about it later, but oh man, that sucks. So, since that was step one, step two, save often, anchor it backups. When in doubt, back everything up, even if it's on an hour basis, a two hour basis, or whatever, you have to make sure that everything's backed up. There's a story from uh, Pixar when they were developing Toy Story 2, where they had an issue with their servers on site, and they lost all their work. And the only reason why Toy, uh, Toy Story 2 actually came out is because someone who was working on that element had a memory problem. But all their servers crashed like that, and they lost everything on site. So you have to make uh, backup copies, you have to store it off-site, you have to have a way to restore your information if it's an important project. Very careful about that one, because you can have it bite you really hard if you're not careful. So ask questions, that's the next one. Never be afraid to ask a question like, hey, I don't get it. Can you explain this to me? Or if you're learning yourself, what's the message boards? There's a ton of really active message boards for software developers and programmers, whether it's game programming or just traditional computer science programming. But the trick is ask questions. If you get stuck and you start to struggle and you don't ask questions, it's just going to make it worse. You're never going to get the help you need, and you're going to get discouraged and quit program. And no one wants to do that. Can't explain in English, can't code it. A very common mistake for new programmers is to try to jump right into the code and be like, well, I kind of understand, I'm going to start to do it. And then they get completely stuck and lost because they don't understand what they're trying to do. So if you can't explain it to yourself, you can't code it. The next step has a direct meaning of that. Work through the logic in English first, or whatever your native language is. But explain it to yourself first. Then translate it from actual code to pseudo code. So it looks a little bit more like code, but it's not quite code syntax. And then actually put it in code. If you follow that process, you're going to hit every single potential theoretical flaw that you're going to see as you design. And that will help a lot too. This is kind of a, my own personal suggestion on this, but turn line numbers on. Some developers say, no, no, it doesn't matter. Some developers say, you have to have line numbers. It makes even subconsciously bug your code to you. Because you can see, all right, well, it's kind of up there at the top, and I know it was around this section, so I should be looking at this component, this component, and this component. But it does help actually speed the bump up. So, pro tip, turn those on. Spacing is important. 
If you can't read your code, have it anyone else who turned out. So make sure you use proper spacing and indication, good commenting, but everything should be flowing really in your code. Test your code off. You made a bunch of changes, you haven't tested in a while, you're going to break the code, you're not really sure where it is. So to save yourself an hours of uh, aggravation later, test your code off. There's always going to be a cleaner, more elegant approach to what you're working on, but trying to avoid brute force plays. So if you're doing things like loops where you have a bunch of expressions, that are supposed to be executed every time. Don't write each one of those out individually every single time. Okay, once you, you're still doing that because it makes more sense to them. You're encouraging them not to, but because it makes more sense to them, you run the exam for So, and avoid it, awesome. If you can't avoid it, that's okay too. So make notes for yourself as you go along. Commenting your code is crucial. I can't tell you how many students keep getting to do that. And it's comical because they're like, I don't understand why this doesn't work. Code? No. Okay. Go back and comment code. Try again. And just the process of actually going through and commenting their code helps them understand it. The other two things are more of a sanity check. If you start to get stressed out from programming, this is a much more mental exercise than other activities. So, for example, with art, you can see the result tweaking and eventually looks good. With code, you can search the screen for days on end. Not making progress, you just you, you get stuck and frustrated. So the key thing for this one is if you do start to get stressed, you're so free. This is a mental exercise. So let your mind ponder for a little bit. Go take a walk, go grab a snack, grab some water, whatever. But let your mind not think about it for a couple of days. And by doing that, you'll actually get better results when you come back. So then finally, sometimes the best way to understand something is to try a really simple basic design. So going back to that, you know, draw each of the object first, you can draw one object to the screen, draw more objects to the screen. So the trick is, you start with the smallest example that you can think of first, it'll make everything else a lot easier. 